Good afternoon and good evening from wherever you're joining us across Canada and welcome to this panel session. We'd like to start off by thanking our sponsors, Novartis and Roche for providing educational grants to make this session possible. Through a variety of informative videos and sessions like today, the MS 101 newly diagnosed series will support individuals as they start to navigate their MS journey. Our hope is to help you learn more about the disease, wellness strategies, and much more. My name is Gabrielle Vito, and I'm so pleased to be your moderator for today's event. This month, coincidentally, marks my 25th year since my own diagnosis with MS and the beginning of my MS journey, including my volunteer work with the MS Society of Canada. I have relapsing remitting MS with the onset of fatigue. In my MS journey, I've experienced a huge variety of symptoms from all sorts, including batter, bladder and bowel issues, brain fog, memory loss, vision problems, and loss of strength, balance, and coordination. I've lost the use of every limb, some of them two at a time. I was working in the TV news industry at the time of my diagnosis, that 25 years ago, when I made the switch from reporting to producing, as it was much less physically demanding. I had to stop working completely in 2003, and I've been home on disability ever since. Now, volunteering with the MS Society has given me an outlet. It's enabled me to keep using the skills I have and keep myself educated about MS research and what's going on in the MS community. So I'm so pleased to be here with you today, and I'm coming to you from the town of Parksville on Vancouver Island in British Columbia. Now, before we start with today's panel, I need to go over some housekeeping issues with everybody. So we've muted everyone's microphones, and you should all be aware that the webinar is being recorded for future viewing on the YouTube channel. But no participant names or identifying information is being displayed. If you have questions today, please type them into the chat box, which should be on the right of your screen. We're going to be trying to get to as many questions as possible today, and we do already have quite a list of pre-submitted ones, so we'll do our best. Um, but also please note that questions pertaining to really specific personal situations cannot typically be adequately answered in this type of a venue, and we recommend that you contact your MS healthcare team directly for your specific situation. Now, please note that the MS Society of Canada does not approve, endorse, or recommend any specific product or therapy, but provides information to assist individuals to make their own decisions. Now, I'd like to welcome and introduce our first panelist. Jesse Mursky is someone who has been recently diagnosed with MS, and he'll kick off our session by sharing some of his personal story about his MS journey so far. So welcome, Jesse. Please go ahead. Perfect. Thank you so much for having me. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak here today, uh, and I'm really looking forward to, to hearing what the other panelists have to say uh, in answer to some of the questions that were submitted previously. As mentioned, my name is Jesse, and I'm newly diagnosed with relapsing remitting MS. I'm based in Toronto, Ontario, um, and I'm just going to sort of go through my, my journey so far uh, in terms of my diagnosis and how that all happened. Um, so I'm just going to go from the start. So in late 2019, I was not necessarily in a good place. I didn't realize it at the time, but I was full of anxiety. I drank and smoked an excessive amount. I was always tired and fatigued. At times, usually while in transit coming home from work, my legs would mysteriously feel like what I could only describe as jelly. I remember always asking myself, how will I walk home from the bus stop if my legs feel like this? It was bad enough that I often felt like I would fall flat on my face on the bus or the subway. On top of that, one day in September that year, uh, I noticed that I began to trip on words or stutter in a meeting at work. So I was really concerned. I saw my family doctor, Immediately, he could see that I had experienced what he called a nervous breakdown. He provided anti-anxiety medication. I found his diagnosis to be validating. It's a definite feeling of, oh, I'm, I'm not totally crazy. Um, but I told him that something was wrong in my brain. I just knew something was off. So I asked him for an MRI. He said, okay. I had the MRI in November and received a call back in December the following month. I was asked to come see the doctor again in January. January 5th, 2020 was the first time I heard a doctor say MS. Uh, there was definitely an awkward moment where I had to ask him, sorry, what's MS? 
Uh, so a lot of confusion at that point. I saw a neurologist for the first time in February. That's when I first heard words like DMT or disease modifying therapy, CIS uh, for clinically isolated syndrome, disability, wheelchair, lesions. All these words were being used in relation to me. Feeling lost, I reached out to the MS Society and joined a support group. I knew I wanted to get involved with this new community I now belong to, and I was just looking for some way to meet other people uh, in, in, in this community. In August 2020, I had a lumbar puncture. My diagnosis, which up until this point was still CIS or clinically isolated syndrome, was confirmed as a diagnosis of definite MS, uh, more specifically relapsing remitting MS, as, as I mentioned previously. Uh, that was August 19th. It's funny how these dates uh, will stay with you. So it was that summer I began to reflect on everything. I spent a lot of time going for walks and trying to make sense of it all. I came to some realizations. I realized that I don't have time. There's no time to feel sorry for myself. There's no time to worry about things that I can't control. And there's no time for fear. I realized that I needed to take control of the situation in any way I can. So the support group I joined uh, continued monthly. I met some amazing people who were like me. I didn't know anyone with MS prior to my diagnosis. Through the support group, I learned about the stages of grieving. I learned about the concept of old me and new me. I learned I was grieving for the old me. My concept really resonated with me. Uh, through a friend, I learned about a Canadian charity dedicated to MS education called Direct MS and a diet they've developed called the Best Bet Diet. I adopted that diet and my fatigue, which had been a daily presence in my life up until that point, slowly started to alleviate. My jelly legs, as I called them, started to disappear. I realized that there are elements of my disease that I can control. More recently, I connected with some organizers at the MS Society and started volunteering myself. Those organizers were very interested in starting a new support group for people who are newly diagnosed with MS, and they felt that I could help by facilitating that group. We got that up and running in September, and I continue to meet incredible, resilient people every month in the new group. That group meets at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the first, first Wednesday of every month, uh, which means our next meeting is tomorrow at 6 p.m. So uh, going back to the old me versus new me concept, uh, reflecting on it, I realized that old me was full of anxiety. Old me would never spend time talking uh, about himself to a group of strangers. Uh, old me was also always hungover. I decided that new me is educated. New me wants to help others and new me is hopeful. So there is silver lining here, I've realized. Now is the time to take stock on my life. Now is the time to reflect from my new and unique vantage point. Thanks to my diagnosis, I have a clear objective here, a clear goal and something to take control of. This is something that is bigger than me. Like I said before, because I have MS, I don't have time to feel sorry for myself. I don't have time to live in fear, and I don't have time to not try and to not be hopeful. My last MRI showed new lesions and disease activity. I believe it's going to take time to stabilize with my diet, exercise, and medication. But I have to be hopeful, and I have to try. I don't smoke anymore. I barely drink. I make time every day to do things I love, like reading books and playing music. In addition to my disease-modifying therapy, I live by this new Best Bet diet, which is a dairy, gluten, and legume-free diet. I exercise every day, and I go for lengthy walks as often as possible. These are the things I can control and will continue to, con to control until I can't. So thank you all for your time. Again, I, I really appreciate being asked to, to speak here today and to get to share my story. Um, I hope my story uh, can help to provide hope to today's participants. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jesse, for being here and thank you for sharing your story with us and for the volunteer work you're doing with your support group. So I'd like to introduce the rest of our panel at this point and then we'll get straight to questions. So we've got Dr. Sarah Donkers joining us, who is a physiotherapist. Nancy Bogle is an MS nurse. She's also here today. Denise Kendrick is joining us. She's an occupational therapist. And Natasha Vincent is joining us, and she is an MS navigator, uh, one of the frontline MS staff people. So we're going to get started with a couple of questions that were pre-submitted during the, res the registration process. 
Um, we're going to start with MRIs. When someone is newly diagnosed, are regular MRIs helpful to monitor progression and make decisions about treatment? And if so, how often do most neurologists order an MRI for this? I would suggest maybe, Nancy, we throw it over to you for this one. You don't think that's a neurologist question? No? That's a really good point. Maybe this is one of those questions where exactly our recommendation is that you talk specifically to your MS healthcare team. Um, different neurologists may have um, slightly different takes on this question. I know that's been my personal experience over the decades that I've been dealing with MS. So that's a question that maybe you should ask specifically of your neurologist. Thank you, Nancy. I can speak to now, the nursing the role with it, if you'd like briefly, but I, I think I would I would defer to uh, our neurologist on the panel. But in terms of a nursing perspective, where we come in in terms of MRIs is kind of to explain to patients why we do MRIs, that they're important in terms of seeing whether or not the disease modifying therapy is working for the patient or not. Um, we can remind patients it's important to get their MRIs. We can support them around some patients have anxiety around MRIs, and sometimes they will feel very shy and reluctant to share that. And there are ways to give patients medications so that they can deal with claustrophobia and tolerate an MRI. Uh, so they don't have, they don't avoid the MRI because of embarrassment, um, because they're because they're anxious. So we have to kind of tease that out as nurses. Uh, certainly, the frequency. As so we can talk about the purpose of it and how to support them to have it. And, but in terms of the frequency of MRIs, um, the ordering would, would really be a neurologist question. I hope that helps. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Nancy. I think that's great perspective. I'm going to move now to Sarah and Denise. Um, we've had quite a few questions from relatives or friends, family members of people with uh, a new diagnosis. And their question is around exercise. Specifically, some um, people who enjoy fairly extreme exercise at this point, downhill skiing, biking, and they're wondering about people with MS, can they continue to do these types of activities or do most have to adjust to adaptive equipment at some point? Do you so enjoy Sarah it or is it Oh, doing what you enjoy. Sorry, go ahead. Finding ways to continue to do what you enjoy is really important. Um, in terms of what happens typically, it's very individualized. Um, I have actually downhill skied with a number of people who have MS um, and they're, they're safe to do it. Uh, I have also worked with individuals who are high level athletes in other areas, um, like marathon runners or surfers. and when they're feeling well, they can keep doing what they're doing, but they often um, keep in the back of their mind a sort of backup plan if they do get too tired while they're out, um, making sure they're safe and they're with buddies. Um, and then uh, on before maybe Denise chimes in on adaptive equipment, uh, I just want to emphasize that um, there's lots of options to keep people doing what they love to do um, safely and uh, with downhill mountain biking, because I know you mentioned that, um, I've worked with someone to get them a grant to help support an electric bike so that they could um, not burn themselves out as much on the climb and still enjoy the downhill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would just echo what Sarah said there. Um, keep doing what people enjoy doing. Be mindful of the, the fatigue that may occur um, a little bit earlier when you're exerting yourself at that high level and also just be mindful of the day after. So a lot of people find that when they do push themselves a bit more physically, um, you know, they're, they're really enjoying it, but they may wake up the next day with a higher level of physical fatigue than they typically might. So just kind of planning for that a little bit. Um, and then also I think what Sarah mentioned about having a backup plan is really important. So if your plan is to drive home after hitting the slopes for six hours, is that going to cause you to have a bit of difficulty when you're driving because your legs might be a bit more fatigued than they would be if you'd just gone for a walk. So just thinking those things through and, and kind of having that backup plan is really important. What I sometimes Excellent. encounter, um, what patients sometimes ask me is, 
will this make me worse permanently? And that's a good conversation to have. So I've been around MS for a few years, kind of more than I care to mention now. But I remember we used to we used to discourage people from activity because they'd become more symptomatic. Now we recognize how important it is to be active just in terms of well-being, purpose of life, and the anti-inflammatory effect it has. It actually helps your MS. And so we need to tell people, you might feel worse or more symptomatic, but it's not going to make your MS worse. It's a temporary, temporary worsening of symptoms. That's an excellent point. Thank you all. Uh, so staying in the physical realm a little bit, um, workspace, workspace modification. If a workspace needs to be modified or more ergonomically accessible, can an OT help? So Denise, we'll throw that one directly to you. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Um, that's a big part of my role here in the MS clinic is around helping people to maintain their employment. And some of that is around looking at adaptations or accommodations in the workspace. Um, ergonomics are sort of the, the most commonly thought of way to accommodate someone in the workplace, but also having conversation with an OT around how can you just adapt the way you're doing your work outside of the ergonomics as well. So we know that um, as Jesse mentioned, um, you know, fatigue plays into things a lot and sometimes that can affect people's ability to attend during their meetings at work or other work duties. So how can an occupational therapist kind of come in and look at what are the demands that you have in your work day? What are the various duties that you're doing that make up your job? And how can we get creative and accommodate for those to help people to maintain their employment? So that's certainly a, a very strong role of occupational therapy is to look at, at um, people's participation in the workforce. Excellent. Um, so question we've had coming in, Nancy, I think this we might direct towards you, if I may. It's a, a question about the differences between the types of MS. What is the difference between relapsing, remitting MS and progressive types of MS? Okay, so, <clears throat> um, Relapsing remitting MS is MS where you have an exacerbation or a relapse or a flare, and then it resolves and goes away and you kind of go back to baseline. Uh, what we know over time is that people stop having just straight relapses and full recovery, but they will have partial recovery and accumulate disability. Um, so we call it a stepwise fashion towards disability. So the relapses, um, will leave residual deficits behind. And then over time, what happens is people then become di diagnosed or the classification changes to something called secondary progressive, which really means you still may have relapses, but you're accumulating disability. You don't sort of recover from the relapses. Um, and untreated MS, the natural history would say that most people without uh, any intervention or disease modifying therapy that's effective would be in that category of secondary progressive MS in approximately 10 to 15 years. The other category uh, generally is called primary progressive MS and primary progressive MS means exact, is exactly what it says. It's primary from the beginning. It means when, when you have onset of MS, uh, you don't really have relapses, although you kind of do, but it's more of an insidious progressive event from onset. So you kind of continue to accumulate disability. There are features that are salient to each category. Um, with relapsing and remitting, it tends to be in younger people. And uh, that, is, that would be the bulk of people who are diagnosed with MS would have, would have relapsing remitting MS. And primary progressive tends to appear when people are older, um, although I don't know that 40 is really old anymore, but um, so it tends to have a later onset and it often presents with um, problems walking, some, some movement problems, that sort of thing. The, the, I think the take home message is that so much of MS now and MS care today is so complex, but it's treatable and it's manageable. And that's a huge trajectory shift over the last 25 years. There's hope. 
Excellent point, Nancy. It's completely different from when I was diagnosed, and that's really important for people to realize. So thank you. Okay, the next question I'm going to go to would be for Jesse. Jesse, you touched on this in your story that you shared with us. And this question is advice for newly diagnosed or people awaiting a diagnosis. So it sounds like they may be in a similar situation that you were. Um, any general advice for how to get through that process? Yeah, and I kind of touch on this in, in the story at the beginning. Um, I think finding other people with MS uh, was a big thing for me. Feeling like you're a part of the community was a big thing for me. So I joined a support group. We now have that newly diagnosed support group as well that people are always welcome to join. Um, and then this is something that I think is maybe, um, it definitely helped me, uh, but you know, each person is different, was educating myself. So I read all the books recommended on the MS Society's website, but then against my neurologist's wishes, I read other books as well. I, I really found it important to learn as much as possible. I think the neurologist really wanted me to keep my scope of learning within the MS Society's uh, book recommendations. Uh, which were all good and helpful, um, but I just found I needed uh, to continue after I had finished there. Um, so for me, the education piece was a really big thing. I mentioned like I've changed my diet. Um, there are many diets out there and this is the one that seems to be working for me. Um, so any changes that you want to make, I find it, it helps to empower yourself by educating yourself um, before you just assume the worst or essentially that, you know, assume the worst. Um, so I find education and community have been the big things for me. Excellent perspective. Thank you, Jesse. Um, I'm going to stay with that, this theme, sort of the, the newly diagnosed theme, exactly what we're talking about today. Expectations during the first year of diagnosis. I think this one, Jesse, I'll go back to you and maybe Nancy, this might be something, I know this is a hard one for a lot of people to, to answer, but it's also one of the biggest questions we hear is what can I expect during the first year of my diagnosis? Um, I mean, uh, because I'm just coming out of my first year, like August 19th was the was the one year mark for my diagnosis. The, the last six months of that first year were definitely uh, focused on getting my medication sorted out. Um, so I don't think, I, I guess that that was a big thing is, you know, I had multiple MRIs done, which my understanding is that that won't happen long term. It will probably be more of an annual thing going forward. Um, but really figuring out the medication, uh, getting new MRIs done with uh, like enhanced uh, lesions. Uh, so I think really finding uh, the information that the neurologist needs in order to prescribe and diagnose accordingly. Um, and then for me, like I said, uh, the big thing was getting involved in the community, uh, meeting other people with MS, because as I mentioned before, I didn't know what MS was. I didn't know anyone with MS uh, prior to my diagnosis. So the first year for me was really getting the medication and diagnosis sorted out, but also the, the personal piece was, was meeting other people with MS in the education side. Thank you, Jesse. Nancy, any perspective you can offer? Um, I think that what I have found in my practice is um, sometimes people are just relieved when they have a diagnosis. You know, there is that some symptoms can be quite subjective. Uh, people know something's not quite right, but that confirmation that there is something going on and is a validation. And for many people, they feel like this is a place I can now, and now I know what's going on. Where do I go from here? Um, it's more complex now because at one time, people would be diagnosed with MS and we'd take a watch and wait approach. Um, and that, you know, psychologically is helpful because if someone had a relapse, then they're diagnosed and the relapse, they recover from that relapse, it gives them time to kind of process the information. What happens to patients commonly now is that they're rapidly diagnosed, um, they're having MRIs, they may have lumbar punctures, and then they're presented with treatment options quite quickly. Um, treatment options, and that process is complex as well. The oral medications are a little more straightforward, but when you're looking at the intravenous medications, there are many decisions to be made around that. And um, even getting on those medications, you suddenly have 
the medication, you have a patient support program, you have your MS nurse. So just navigating and knowing who to call can be a lot for people. Then patients have to understand how am I monitored? How do I know if this works? So they have to understand the purpose of MRI. Um, they have to understand why they see their neurologist and roughly how often they'll see their neurologist. They'll need to know about symptom management. Um, one of the big things for patients early on is that vigilance around if you've had a relapse and every time you have a twitch or a bit of numbness, you know, is it coming back again? Particularly if someone's had a very disabling relapse, that's terrifying. So we spend a lot of time reassuring people and helping patients become their own expert on their symptoms. Um, we have to talk about lifestyle and the things that patients can do. Jesse talked about this, that sense of control. I think it's so important what we give back to patients is you have a role in your care. This is a collaborative process and you do have some control over things. Things like exercise matter. They, they matter for your MS and the anti-inflammatory effect. They matter to prevent comorbidity or other health complications from MS. And being outside and exercising just makes us feel good and look good. Uh, there are things like diet. We know diet matters. Uh, managing stress, not smoking. When patients are able to do those kinds of things and they're armed with that kind of information, they feel I, um, the word is overused, but I can't think of another one right now, empowered. So I'll use that. Um, I think another part is that people know who, if you're, if you're associated with an MS clinic, how do you navigate the system? And who is this person? Who is that person? And what's the best way for me to reach someone? Um, the other thing I start with with patients, or I try to, is you have to understand what meaning does this diagnosis have for patients? Uh, what do they know about MS? Because sometimes people have a very uh, sort of a, an antiquated notion of MS. They may have known someone in their childhood or maybe in their family who was highly disabled, bedridden, or in a wheelchair. And those are important things to know right away so we can help um, reassure them and provide them with up-to-date information that that is not necessarily the case in MS anymore. I also want to know what matters, like what matters to you in your life, what's important. Um, I remember a patient I had who really, really wanted to have a family, and that was just pivotal. And now we can tell people, yeah, you can. Uh, let's just see what kind of medication you're on, what kind of medication works for pregnancy, or maybe we want to start pregnancies early if someone has very active MS, those kinds of things. Um, I suppose the other thing is hope. Um, making sure people have hope and they may have to redefine their lives, but what they have, we have to find hope and we're there to support them with their hope. I hope that answers the question. Excellent. Yep. That's fabulous, Nancy. That's a great overview. Really, really important messages for people to, to take away. Um, speaking of all the different aspects, like we've been hearing about from our panel today, I'd like to bring in Natasha, who is our MS navigator on the panel today. And I'd like her, um, Natasha, if I could ask you to give a little brief outline of what sort of supports MS navigators can offer in this very complex world of MS. Yeah, thank you. So the MS Navigator team, and there is a team of us uh, that work across the country, no matter where we are, we can help you where you are in English or in French. Our primary goal is to offer information and resources for anyone who's living with MS or who is affected by MS. So, you know, family members, children, other loved ones. Uh, we sometimes have employers call in when they hear from, you know, one of their team members that they've been recently diagnosed and they want to make sure that they're moving forward with accommodations um, in a good way, in a legal way as well, ethical, is something else to keep in mind. Um, so we're here for everyone. It's a free service and we're always happy to help is something that uh, I mentioned to everyone one that I speak to, because even if it's not a program or service that we offer here at the MS Society, what we're tasked to do is based on the challenge or question that is presented to us in that moment by that person, we'll look out at the community level or the provincial level or even federal level to see what's out there to address that particular need. So even sometimes there are people who are Canadian who want to look at clinical trials elsewhere. Um, so we'll look at uh, the different uh, reliable resources that are out there for um, 
you know, uh, clinical trials uh, that are evidence-based uh, and eventually will be peer-reviewed. Um, there are also people who are overseas who want to come to Canada for treatment. And so we can give them some basic um, steps and guidelines in that particular case, because our focus is on Canadians and uh, the Canadian healthcare system. Um, but we can also, you know, address some fundamental questions for people who are overseas wanting to get treatment in Canada as well. Excellent. Thank you, Natasha. I also have a couple of questions here that I'd like you to address about accessing support. So for those that aren't yet comfortable participating in groups, is there a place we can learn about more about accessing one on one support for things like coping skills? So we do have a, a program called MS one to one. There is a French version of this program as well. With, the direct translation would be twinning or jumelage. Um, and so you can be matched up with a peer who is also living with MS. And depending on how the application is filled out, and it takes about, you know, maybe 10, maximum 15 minutes to fill out, you can be as specific or as vague as you want. But the more specific you are, the better we're going to be able to match you. So once the application is filled, it goes to the coordinator. Um, they'll look through our database of volunteers tears. And like I mentioned, um, they themselves are living with MS or we have a um, aspect of the program that is dedicated towards caregivers. So caregivers can also try to be matched with another caregiver who's living in a situation or experiencing some of the same things that they are. So it is a very popular program and uh, we like to hear feedback from folks who use it and match uh, matches last for up to six months. But it doesn't mean that someone has to stick with their volunteer match for the entire six months you use it as you need it. Excellent. Now I have another question here that I would suggest maybe is another example of a specific situation. And I would recommend dialing in or um, using the website or live chatting into one of the navigators. This person's asking about feeling like they're being dismissed. What would be the best way to navigate through the system? Took two years for me to get a diagnosis. So again, a very specific situation that in this venue, we probably can't give you an adequate answer to, but that's the type of thing where an MS navigator may be able to help you and give you advice on specific resources to access in your community. So I would really encourage you to directly contact one of the MS navigators for that. We also had a question about how to access Jesse's support group. Um, there is a general email, supportgroups at mssociety.ca, and I'm going to suggest that staff put that in the chat for everybody to see. You can also access that through the MS Society's website. Um, how to access all the support groups and all the peer one-on-one -on -one groups are it's all listed there on the MS Society web website. So um, I think at this point, we're going to go back to Nancy. And I have a question here about who should I initially contact when I have neurological symptoms, relapses, or additional flare ups. Again, this may depend on your particular situation. But as an MS nurse, Nancy, maybe you can give us perspective on that. Okay, um, generally, what someone would do is if they're followed by an MS clinic, they would be reaching out to an MS nurse and COVID and both both COVID and technology have sort of changed the ways that people contact nurses now in clinics. Um, often there's a format where people can email in their symptoms. There's also the option to call and then usually a nurse will call back and screen you, go through a relapse kind of questionnaire to see if we can tease out if it looks like it's just worsening symptoms uh, related to say having a cold or a flu um, and then reassure the patient as needed or if needed they can come in or be seen or speak with a neurologist by phone. Uh, in, in the event someone's in a private clinic and there isn't a nurse they probably would be reaching out to the neurologist's office directly speaking to the, uh, the MOA. Uh, many neurologists now have email and you could email your symptoms in to the neurologist and they're forwarded and neurologists will often respond directly. Excellent, great advice, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to move now over to exercise. As we've heard from the panel, things have changed. When I was diagnosed, I was 
warned about exercise and I used it as an excuse for years and I can't do that anymore. So the importance of exercise has really been realized. So I'd like to throw it now to uh, Sarah Donkers. We have a couple of questions about exercise. What exercises are recommended that are less likely to trigger a heat relapse and the best and safest way to gain muscle strength? If you could take a stab at those ones, please. Yes, you bet. Um, so with the heat sensitivity, it's less about what movement you're doing and more about the environment you're in. Mm -hmm. um, so there's lots of research right now looking at even individuals who don't have heat sensitivity, just MS in general, um, exercising in a temperature controlled environment that's less 18 degrees or less. Um, so if you're doing any sort of uh, endurance where you're getting your heart pumping um, and you do suffer from uh, heat intolerance, then uh, try a temperature controlled environment. You can also try some pre-cooling strategies. Um, and there's information I know through the MS Society that you can get on that. Um, but light, breathable clothing, having a fan nearby if you need to, ice water, cooling vest. Um, you don't even have to get fancy. I've had participants and, and patients I've worked with uh, dip uh, one of their biggest socks in water, put it in the freezer, and then pin that around their neck or around their wrists when they're, they're doing their movements. Um, so it's less about the type of exercise and more about the environment you can do it in and um, some of these pre-cooling and, and cooling strategies while you're exercising. And I have forgotten the second half of your question. Sorry, it was about strength, <laughs> building up muscle strength. What's the best kind of exercises for that? Building up muscle strength. So that depends on where you're starting. Um, anything with, with the goal of improving strength uh, needs to put load through your body and needs to put load through um, particularly the muscles you're trying to gain strength. So this can be body weight itself. Um, typically, if you have a lower amount of weight that you're using, you need slightly higher reps, which can still help you activate and tone a muscle. If you really wanna uh, gain strength or gain power in a muscle, um, then typically you need a slightly higher weight. Um, so it is safe to do strength training uh, in, in individuals if, if you have MS. Um, Again, it's a bit of pre-planning. So uh, Nancy had already mentioned this idea of uh, pseudo exacerbations or tempor temporary increases in your symptoms. Um, at first, when you're experiencing them, they can, they can be scary, um, but they typically resolve and they typically resolve within 30 minutes after uh, your exercise. So if you are doing something to strengthen a muscle, and you're working it to that fatigue or to that decrease in quality of movement, you have to plan for the fact that you may not be able to move as well functionally afterwards. So sometimes there's safety concerns with that. So if you've driven yourself to the gym, um, uh, driving home or having a rest before you drive home, um, but also walking, right? So it, it's such a fine balance where you wanna um, put yourself in a situation where you can challenge yourself um but then maintaining safety afterwards uh so mm -hmm. sometimes i have individuals even though they don't need a walker or nordic poles to walk um they'll bring them with them because after a training session just for that pseudo exacerbation or that that temporary period either it's fatigue maybe it's foot drop like a specific muscle weakness um maybe it's balance and coordination or perhaps spasticity just temporarily gets worse and they drag their toe. Um, there is that moment of, of safety um, uh, to consider. That being said, it is still safe to, to strength train. And uh, something we see is actually the severity and the length of these pseudo exacerbations um, decrease as your um, nervous system and muscular system starts to adapt. Mm. 
If I could just add uh, one thing to that as well, because uh, one of the programs that we have here at the MS Society is the quality of life program. And there are various medical devices, including cooling products like adaptive clothing that we can fund mm -hmm. underneath that program. So that's something else that um, you can approach the MS Navigator team about or look uh, on our website mm -hmm. if you you know, want to do it yourself, you can do it yourself. Or if you want help from a navigator, we can definitely help walk you through that process too. That's really good to know. Could, could I go back to the question around um, contacting a, a clinic or a neurologist with respect to potential relapse symptoms? Something I, I missed, I think, was that what's important is that people do report these symptoms um, because if it is a real relapse, it could be an indication that your disease modifying therapy is providing a suboptimal response or coverage. We want to know these things because the idea is that you're you're not having relapses or they're very infrequent. Um, we know that early active disease drives disability, so it's important to report those things. Um, that's part of your role as we collaborate together in care. You're not bothering us. That's our job. <laughs> No, that's a really good point because it, it can be very, especially in the early stages, it can be very challenging yes. to figure out, am I having a relapse or are these just mm -hmm. a flare up of symptoms because I overdid it or because I got hot or whatever. Yeah. And people feel um, it's, you know, it's, it, it's intimidating that whether we mean it or not, it can be intimidating for people initially. So um, I, I encourage that, that you're, you have every right to call us and reach out to us. Excellent point, Nancy. Thank you. Um, I, I just kind of staying along that line, I think in COVID times, we've had a couple of questions about people having frustrations because they're not having face-to-face -face visits. Everything has mm -hmm. to be over the phone. Um, so they're feeling like they're not being, not getting the referrals they would perhaps in normal times. Um, so advice about my doctor's not seeing patients and my neurologist is dismissing me. How do I get a referral to the MS clinic? So this process may be, I suspect, different in different provinces across the country as to how exactly referrals happen. But is there anybody on the panel that can give some perspective about that flow? Um, I could yes. offer a suggestion because um, the way that question was worded, it sounded like the neuro their neurologist was not necessarily affiliated with an MS clinic. Um, that would I might be my, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, um, I, I think you're right. That would be my takeaway as well, yeah. Yeah, so if that's the scenario, one thing you could try to do is go back to your uh, family physician or your general practitioner um, and, and share or express those concerns. Um, because there might be an alternative route to referring you to uh, the MS clinic. And depending on where you're located, it never hurts to call the clinic um, mm -hmm. themselves, like Nancy mentioned. Most clinics yeah. have websites that will tell you how the referral process works. And, and we take calls mm -hmm. from people even when they're not necessarily our patients and, you know, tell them where the closest clinic is or direct them as to how they can be referred to us. Yeah, and perspective wise, I mean, I'm a dinosaur, but it was my GP who then referred me to a neurologist and that neurologist referred me to an MS clinic neurologist because his area was not MS. Now, it was not a fast process, especially in the early days when you're dealing with the news of a potential diagnosis. It can feel very long. It took months to happen, but that's how it happened for me in BC decades ago. Mm -hmm. So another area I wanted to address, because we've had a couple of questions about it, and that is becoming a parent, becoming pregnant specifically for women with MS. Um, I've, we've had a couple of questions, everything from, I've read that if you have a baby, there might be significant attack. Generally, what does that look like and how do we plan for that? So again, this is one of the big questions that a lot of young people facing an MS diagnosis um, have to think about. And uh, there are a lot of strategies, I know, that uh, can be offered. And I, Nancy, would that be your area or Dr. Donkers? Combined? 
I don't know, probably combined, right? Go for it. Do you want? Um, I think, and okay, so now I, I, I have to, I'm a self-confessed dinosaur too. <laughs> That's a very good term because um, I would fit into that category. I mean, early on, I would tell people, you better have a baby right now because we don't know what's going to happen. Um, treatments at the time were sort of modestly effective. So we really encourage people to have children quite quickly. So I can remember patients having, I think I had one patient who had three babies in three years. You know, that wow, that's a lot. But now we're able to say um, that, you're, you know, we modify things. This is a lifelong condition but we plan for it. So I keep hearing today what we talk about is planning and, and that, which is great. And so we look at what the patient, first things we usually tell young women is you can have babies, right? Uh, if you wanna have babies, you can have babies. Let's look at how active your disease is. Um, let's look at a therapy that is easy to come off of briefly while you're trying to conceive those kinds of things and then we usually strategize and plan around once you have had once you are pregnant uh, we talk about how our immune systems down regulate uh, so that ms is actually more quiet or there's a period of essence and fewer relapses during pregnancy but that in the postpartum period there's actually uh, a higher risk of relapse so we try to strategize around that so that when a patient has a baby, then right away we're looking at putting them back on their disease modifying therapy. So it's all about timing. It's a lot about working together. And then, you know, many of our patients, because the options for treatment are so varied now and, and, and effective, many of our patients are also able to, to breastfeed. They may have to pump and dump for a bit, but they're, they have that option as well. You know, they're really it's such a joy to be around those things um, and watch people have some modifications to their lives, but the normal milestones, the milestones many of us just take for granted. And um, I will just add, uh, or I guess reiterate from what Nancy said, don't let having MS prevent you from um, getting pregnant, preventing you from experiencing parenthood if, if that is what you want. It does not have to be um, a prevention or a, a limitation. Um, parenting is hard, <laughs> pregnancy is hard, having a newborn is hard. Um, so don't, don't do it on your own or don't, don't try to do it without um, discussing it with, with your care team and with that bit of planning. Um, mm -hmm. And then, yeah, keep in mind almost, I'd say 80% of the people that I have worked with, um, they actually feel their best when they are pregnant. Yeah. Um, and, and they might, you might have a relapse, but it doesn't, it doesn't mean it's moving your disease course along any faster. Um, sometimes because you felt so well during pregnancy, you, and then mm -hmm. you have a baby and your nervous system is stressed, you're tired. Sometimes yeah. it's just flare up of, of symptoms and not necessarily um, a relapse. So um, be a parent, right? Yeah. Um, I hear a, from a lot of people further down the road, uh, you talk about uh, filling your cup and creating a social network and a support system and being a parent and a creating a family is a huge, wonderful opportunity. Um, to, to help you live well with MS if that is what you're after. Thank you both. It's That's great true. perspective. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, I think now we do a lot of symptom management after babies are born, sorry. So you, as Sarah's right, people can feel so exhausted afterwards, especially a first baby because, well, really nothing prepares you for that, I don't think, and, and the, the exhaustion for any parent. So we do a lot of um, symptom management reassurance around that, um, helping people recognize they're tired, it's normal to be tired, this isn't their MS getting worse, those sorts of things. I actually had a patient, uh, I'll just share this briefly because it, it, it fits our, our conversation and it was a lovely moment in my day today. I have a patient who um, had uh, decided to have a baby and very, very reluctant and very scared about it and we've timed everything. And she, 
she did have a relapse in pregnancy, but it was it was okay. And then we got her back on therapy as soon as the baby was born. And she said to her husband, okay, we've got one baby, that's it, never again, I'm not doing that. And we and today he called me out of the blue two years later to say that they're gonna have another baby. And I was shocked because she was so adamant, but she said it's worked, you know, and just to be part of that um, experience and share that with uh, a patient is, um, well, it's it's the beauty of this kind of work, right? And seeing people go on with their lives with some modifications, but filling their cup, it, it's, uh, it's possible and it's huge. Thank you both, great perspective. All right, I'm going to go back to um, our occupational therapist, Denise, on the panel, because we have a very general question here. How can an occupational therapist help and how get how can I get an appointment with one? So Denise, let's hand it over to you. Good question. Um, it's a question I get asked a lot because it's not a, a straightforward um, title, occupational therapy, but the way I kind of like to describe it is, um, you know, anything that you're doing in your day that can be considered an occupation. So whether that be working or knitting or making a meal or getting yourself dressed, these are all things we consider occupations in life. Anything you're having difficulty with because of your MS, because of your symptoms, is a good time to connect with an occupational therapist. Um, and what we really do is, is take a look both at your symptoms and, and break down that activity that you're doing into the, the different pieces of that activity and figure out how you can do things maybe differently. Um, or improve your performance in, in some way. So as far as getting connected with one, it's it, a bit of that depends on, on um, whether or not you're a part of a clinic. You know, some MS clinics have an occupational therapist attached to the clinic, in which case you can probably get a direct referral from your neurologist. Otherwise, I would say look at your closest rehab hospital. So most um, cities across Canada do have outpatient rehabilitation programs at their local hospitals. Some of them um, are specialists in neurological conditions. So it may not be just MS, but it may be that you'd be working with an OT who's familiar with things like MS and Parkinson's disease and things like that. Um, so that would be the next place to look, I would say. If you do have extended health care benefits for occupational therapy, which isn't typical, um, but it's always worth looking at like your Blue Cross or your Sun Life benefits, you could look through a provincial organization um, and see if you can, typically most of the websites will have a, a find an OT button that you can click on to look for a private occupational therapist in your area um, that you can either pay for privately or using your benefits. Um, and then the last place I would say is um, everywhere in Canada, you have access to a community occupational therapist that will come and do a home assessment. So that's typically um, someone that you'd work with when you're struggling a little bit more with your mobility and function within your home um, and that person may come and have a look at how you're functioning within your home and whether there's any assistive devices or adaptive aids that could benefit you um, to improve your performance and your independence at home and that would usually be through your local health unit. So um, that's kind of a long way to say just ask those in your care team um, to help you get connected with an occupational therapist. And if possible, somebody with some expertise in MS is, is always good if you're looking at symptom management. Excellent, that's a great overview. Thank you so much. Um, I want to go now to what we've touched on in the discussion today already, and that's DMTs, disease modifying therapies. We've got a couple of questions coming in, um, sort of both ends of the spectrum. People asking, my neurologist is recommending a specific drug. How do I know it's right for me? Other people asking, my neurologist is saying, these are the drugs available, pick which one you want. How do I know which one to pick? So this is a big area. Again, this is a big topic. Um, and I'm going to maybe ask Jesse for your perspective on this as a newly diagnosed person. Mm -hmm. The question around DMTs, can you give any perspective on what your thought process has been around it so far? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I can talk about my experience, of course. Um, as I mentioned before, I, I do take a DMT. I'm currently on Copaxone. Um, but I guess maybe this is a little bit a different experience from the person asking the question, my, or one of the people asking this question. My neurologist said, based on what she's seeing in my imaging, she recommended Copaxone uh, because she didn't feel like it, my uh, disease had progressed enough or, or I had had enough uh, relapses um, that it warranted a stronger drug. That was day one though. That was when I still had clinically isolated syndrome. So that was like last year. As I mentioned it at the beginning, I did have new lesions and disease activity in uh, my May MRI of this year. And my neurologist called me and she, <laughs> she, she said, if I sound like a, a different neurologist to you today, it's because things have markedly changed. Those were her words that are burned into my mind now. Um, so she is now more of the thinking that I should uh, change the DMT to something more aggressive. Um, and it's, uh, I mean, I guess it does leave me where the other person asking the question said, you know, you choose one, you know, you can go really big guns or you can go like one step up from Copaxone because Copaxone uh, seems to be sort of the least, um, I don't know if the word is harmful, but the least side effect um, type DMT. So that's been my experience. I'm sort of in limbo right now, right? Because uh, I have another MRI in November and the, the thinking was, let's see if it's continued since May. And from there, we will determine uh, if I should change medication. So I'm really waiting to see in November if there's new activity to make that evaluation. Um, but I've been uh, spoken to about Ocrevus, which my understanding would be the big guns, or Tecfidero, which my understanding is would be like a step up from Copaxone. Again, I'm, I'm not a neurologist. I don't know if that's completely uh, accurate, um, but I do know that ideally I would like to stay on Copaxone. So I'm really just trying to uh, manage this question based on the data, based on the imaging to see uh, what it would be best for me. But the neurologist seems to be basing this decision just on what they're seeing in my MRI. So based on number of lesions, uh, based on over time, how many new lesions uh, seems to be the indicators for the neurologist to determine if I need the bigger guns or if I can stay on Copaxone. Thank you so much for sharing that perspective with us. Um, from the dinosaur's perspective, when I was diagnosed, there were four treatments available and they were all injectables. And I didn't want to go on drug right away. So I waited four years into my diagnosis before I started on drug. And I went on Rebif at that point and I'm still on Rebif to this day. Um, so everybody's, I think both Jesse and my story show everybody's individual situation is going to be very different. And the situation of course is very different today because now we have infusions and orals and I think there's 17 now different treatments for relapsing remitting MS. So it's a very different um, situation. So it can seem overwhelming, I get it. Uh, Nancy, is there any perspective you wanna offer on how you help patients navigate DMTs? Well, um, I like what you said about the early therapies <clears throat> and there's been such a change in trajectory because I know early on we were so pleased with having something that actually acted upon the disease state itself. But, you know, they're modestly effective, some of them, and also there were side effects and not always as well tolerated. Uh, now we have so many, many more options. Um, what I typically try to tell people is, I think it's really, a some people come in with their, their own ideas, they've done their research, and they're very clear uh, about what they would like to try, and they will make that decision in collaboration with their neurologist. Um, what I often will do if patients are given an option, because that can be quite terrifying for some people, is, well, what should I choose? What would you tell me to take? And so um, I typically will tell people to look at what what's your risk tolerance like what's your risk how do you, how do you feel about risk um look at the efficacy of the drug look at how you would comply with the drug and the, and write them down i tell people even in this era of everything is uh, technological and computer you can print it you can put it in your computer if you want but make it visual make a visual 
what are the risks, what are the benefits, and look at these categories, and it will help you come to a decision. Talk it over with family members. Um, I do often refer people to the MS Society website because you still have um, a really great decision-making tool that helps pe people make decisions as well. And uh, I think for patients, what can happen is if they're changing a therapy, they often are revisiting the diagnosis. So for example, if you're on a therapy and and Jesse alluded to this, he was clinically isolated syndrome and then he was then being asked to, to consider a, a change in therapy. Not only is that a change in therapy, that's revisiting the diagnosis. So there's a kind of an emotional process around that as well. Um, I think my take home message would be that we really do think uh, we use treatment when we can treat MS, we use treatment as prevention. We, 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 do, we use it early on and uh, we look for high efficacy medications that keep your disease under control and prevents disability and you go on and have babies and you know do whatever you want, downhill ski, whatever. So those are the kind of the take home, the things that I would think about telling my patients. Excellent. Thank you, Nancy. And to follow up, I've got a couple of questions now about specific drugs and I'm, or specific DMTs. Again, I'm going to suggest that in your specific situation or specific drugs, that is something you need to speak to your healthcare team about. Um, but I will ask you, Nancy, uh, are there DMT options for all forms of MS? I wonder if um, Sarah would like to speak to this. She might be, um, that might be more of a neuro neurologist question. If I could defer that, uh, would that be okay? I'm not a neurologist, so we'll just, we'll, we'll just clarify that. Um, I did want to chime in on the DMT conversation, though. Okay. Um, Thank you for clarifying. Um, I wanted to, yeah, just jump in on the DMT conversation because yeah. Yeah. there's more things you have to weigh than just, um, what drug should I take? It's it's also um, what is the affordability of the drug? There's uh, what's the coverage for the drug? Um, what's the delivery method and the delivery time? Um, and there's lots of variability across the country on that. Uh, there's also um, lots of variability in um, the steps um a provider has to go through in order for a drug to be covered right um so sometimes you have to have shown not good success with um using jesse's words like a, a lower gun before you can get the coverage to bring out a big gun um so if you find yourself in that situation where you're like i don't know or if your um neurologist is suggesting one for you just try to ask the why right? Like, why are you recommending this for me? Because then you can keep that, um, that rationale in the back of your mind while you start to, uh, you know, go on your journey and while you have time to learn more. Um, yeah. So yeah, uh, in I terms of really, really accessing the medication, you're right. That's not all medications are accessible. Yeah. yeah. Just to add or to specifically address the question about, um, DMTs available for different types of MS. As of last year, we can officially say yes. So Mazent is available for secondary progressive MS. I think someone mentioned there's over a dozen DMTs that are now available, uh, depending on where you live and which province you're in, for relapsing remitting MS. Mm -hmm. And for primary progressive MS, uh, there is Ocrevus um, for certain conditions, right? So that's a discussion with a neurologist as to whether Ocrevus would be appropriate for that particular individual's primary progressive MS. Um, but there are options regardless of the type um, of MS, uh, the three main types of MS that um, are typically diagnosed. In, in addition to the decision-making tool, we yes, we do have a DMT page um, that allows you to essentially compare um, each of the DMTs that are available across Canada, um, and not all of them are available in every province. So if you're ever confused and if you have a question about it, while we can't address clinical questions 
questions when it comes to DMTs and their specific appropriateness for an individual. If you're wondering about coverage in your province and how to access um, coverage or what is reimbursement potentially going to look like for me, an MS Navigator can help walk you through that process as well and give you some uh, of the alternatives in terms of provincial coverage, private coverage, and sometimes uh, drug company coverage as well. Excellent info. Thank you so much, Natasha, for jumping in because I know it is, it's a big area of concern. It's a, it's an exciting area. It's a, a very available area. And I think it does offer that important element of hope and a little bit of a feeling of control that you're doing something, but there are a lot of options. So having a healthcare team doing some research, um, is is can be very empowering again that word uh to to help individuals make a decision natasha while we have you i would also like to throw in a couple of questions we've had i'm going to combine them they are for um, family members specifically family members who are physically far apart from their ms loved one their loved one who has ms and they are asking for strategies about how to support from afar what can family members do when you're not down the block or just in the next town over yeah, long distance loved ones. Uh, we do get those questions from time to time. And in the pandemic, if there's a silver lining, I mean, there's a few silver linings, right? But um, we've increased our dependence on technology and like digital content. So we do have a section on our website that is dedicated to caregivers and caregiving and the different forms that that can take, which includes um, doing it from afar, from long distance. So it might be a telephone call or checking in with smart devices these days going back to technology it might be setting up your loved one with google home or any of the smart home devices that are available so that um, you can contact them without them necessarily having to use the phone or if it's a monitoring concern um, that both of you share right because there needs to be agreement from both ends um, then that could be an option as well uh, again this is where perhaps an occupational therapist can come in and give some other specific specific uh, recommendations for that particular person's living uh, living situation and the context of caregiving for them and in, in their situation as well, because um, there's just some great technology that's available right now. Um, but beyond uh, the section that's available on our website, you can also get in touch with an MS Navigator. We can port you uh, or point you to, sorry, some of the support groups that are dedicated to caregivers with loved ones who are living with MS. There are also general caregiver groups that are available across the country and sometimes even at the provincial level. And while they might not be specifically geared towards um, people who have loved ones who are living with MS, there's a lot of shared uh, experience um, and a lot of knowledge that can be had within those groups. So we sometimes tend to uh, suggest those groups as well. Excellent. Thank you. Natasha, I'm going to stick with you for a minute for a couple of um, questions we've got in here for specifically declaring openly, being open about the fact you have MS. One specifically about driving. Um, one of my MS symptoms has been blurred vision. I voluntarily stopped driving until those attacks are cleared up. I'm afraid the government will take my license away, but legally should I be declaring I have MS when renewing my driver's license? So this is a question I always tend to check each province. So before I would answer definitively, I would have to check every particular province. If you know, you're know you noticing as an individual that you're having trouble driving for your safety, for the safety of others, it's probably ideal to see if there are some alternative forms of transportation that you could look into. And again, the MS Navigator team can help with what that might look like for your particular area, certainly in urban areas areas, um, that's a lot easier uh, as a solve than in, let's say, a, an or a rural or like suburban area. Um, but there are options out there. There are volunteer community drivers as well. If it's a matter of getting to an appointment or um, getting groceries or other daily activities. Um, but yeah, it looks different from province to province. And there are some provinces where the doctor will report if they're noticing at your visit that, you know, vision might be an issue. Um, but definitely get in touch with a navigator and we can, again, point you in the right direction as to what that would look like for the uh, province that you live in. 
I can add a bit to that as well, Gabrielle, if you'd like. Sure, absolutely. So typically, I think because it is a, a, a legal issue around your license, when you go to renew your driver's license, I think across provinces, you'll always be asked, do you have an, any new medical condition or do you have a medical condition that, that we need to be aware of? So because that becomes a bit of a legal question, you do at that point have to declare um, the diagnosis. And then usually what happens is, is there some type of driver's medical exam or driver's medical form that just needs to be completed either by your GP or by your neurologist and it's really quite straightforward and it's just a chance for somebody on your medical team to speak to whether they think your diagnosis impacts your safety with driving and then that just becomes something that's done you know once every five or eight years depending on the province that you're in so it's pretty standard but it is important if you're asked that question because it comes from a legal standpoint to declare that otherwise there could be implications for your insurance and then the other thing I wanted to add on to just the previous question as well about family members wanting to support from afar, I think what always comes to mind for me is, is this idea that most people with MS struggle with limited energy levels to some extent. So asking your loved one, what are you spending your energy on that you'd rather not spend your energy on? So how can we free up some energy to go for a walk or to, you know, take a dance class or do something you enjoy doing that that's going to give you energy back as opposed to making a meal. So maybe sending a, a voucher for a meal service or, or assisting some way remotely with some of those things that when people's energy becomes limited, they oftentimes end up spending it on the things that they really feel they have to do and the things they should do in their day and a little bit less on the things they want to do. So that's just something to consider is asking your friend or family member, what, what, what are you spending energy on that you don't want to be spending energy on? And how can I help with that? Thank you. Those are great tips. Thanks, Denise. Um, I'm going to go now to another question about legal issues. And again, it may depend on which province you're in. When interviewing for a new job, do I have to disclose that I have MS or do I wait until after I have the job? Does anybody on our panel have some perspective they want to share about that one? I can share a bit about that as well. Um... Nancy might want to chime in as well, just given her length of experience in the field <laughs> compared to mine. Um, but you, you definitely don't have to legally declare your diagnosis in an interview. In fact, you never have to um, disclose that diagnosis. The only time you really have to speak about it is if you're working and you're seeking some accommodations in a more formal sense, then you'll often be asked what kinds of limitations or restrictions you experience. So that's where you might talk more specifically about limitations in the amount of time you can stay standing in a day or limitations in, in physical duties or cognitive duties. Um, but that's the only time you really have to even speak about your MS and you don't even have to name it. You just have to say, I have a condition that limits me in this way. Um, I think, you know, the, the decision to disclose in an interview is, is very personal. And what I always encourage people to do when they're thinking of disclosing in any sense is to think about what that conversation is going to look like and what they're hoping to get back from the person they're disclosing to. Um, and sometimes if people's limitations are a little bit more visible, um, like let's say there's a, a, a more visible mobility limitation, then, then discussing that in an interview might create a little bit more um, transparency and, and you'd hate for somebody to be denied a job because the person across the table doesn't understand what's going on. So that might be a situation where you may want to address this limitation, um, but certainly you're never legally required to. Nancy, any perspective you wanted to give on that one? I think I was privileged to have worked in a very large clinic and we all, we had a social worker and a neurologist who were dedicated to those questions. So we'd often sort of pass them right over. Um, but generally, I think we gleaned, I gleaned some things from them and I would agree with Denise that you don't have to disclose it. Uh, sometimes we would spend time with patients letting them know it's okay to not disclose it. Um, it's, it's personal. 
the but what I sometimes comes up in practice and and with our patients is that there may be a point where they're spending an inordinate amount of energy trying to compensate and hide and their coworkers may be aware that they're having difficulty walking or maybe some fatigue and at that point sometimes it's worthwhile disclosing to your employers so that you can involve occupational therapy bring in some accommodations so that people can stay in the workplace and i have found that for some patients when they actually do uh, disclose and share their condition and they may just say it's a neural law they may just say it's a chronic medical condition they may not be specific it takes some of the uh, pressure off of them and people understand and so it can actually be be a relief for people i think what we try to tell people also is that uh, we work very hard to keep people in the workplace um, so that if they need to work fewer hours or they need accommodation, say four hours a day or six hours a day or three times a week, we've, we've made tremendous strides in helping people stay employed uh, in, in work that they find meaningful or, and also that's necessary as well. Excellent perspective. All right, we are getting close to the end of our time for questions. So at this point, I'd like to throw it open to the panel to give us a little summary, if you will. This has been a fabulous session. Thank you so much for all your insights and information uh, for the newly diagnosed. It's a complex disease and it's a complex system to navigate, but you've really shown us that it is doable with the supports that are available. So Natasha, if I could start with you, if you could just give us a little wrap up. Had to get a cough out of the way. Um, I encourage Sorry. anyone. <laughs> no worries. I encourage anyone who um, has any follow up questions, even after we wrap up tonight, um, to get in touch with the Navigator team. As I had mentioned earlier, it's a free service. We're always happy to help. There's a team of us that work literally from coast to coast, from one end of the country to the other. Um, our toll free number is one eight four four. 859-6789. You don't have to write it down. It's going to be displayed, I believe, at the end. Um, but you can also reach us by email, and we do have live chat um, during business hours uh, every weekday. So whether it is uh, for yourself, uh, as someone who is recently diagnosed, or you've got a loved one who's got questions that even you don't yet know the answers to, uh, they can also get in touch with us. Every conversation is confidential. So if you you call in and then let's say your loved one calls in, we're not sharing information between uh, people unless you both consent to, to do so. Um, but we're happy to um, help people where they're at with the questions and that they have for that particular day. Excellent. Thank you so much, Natasha. And thanks for being here. I'm uh, going to ask Sarah now to give us a few little closing remarks. Great. Um, well, thanks for having me and thanks for attending. Uh, I think we should all sign up for Jesse's support group. He's got um, an amazing, like, I just, I loved hearing your story, Jesse. Thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah. I feel like you've got a little life coach in you <laughs> there. Thank um, you. I appreciate so, that. Yeah. Find your supports. Um, Know that we all, when I say we, um, the MS clinics across the country, the MS society, uh, researchers, we all um, stay connected in some way or another. And so ask someone because they can put you in contact with someone else um, and get you um, I, ideally the answers and connections that you're looking for. Um, and then in terms of exercise and physical activity, be active, anything is better than nothing. Um, and yeah, don't be afraid to reach out and ask for help. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll go now to Denise. Any uh, final thoughts you'd like to share with us today? Thank you. It was just a nice um, chance to get to know everyone here on the panel and connect with a larger audience, which I always enjoy doing. 
Um, I'm going to echo a little bit what Sarah said. I think seek your supports and find out what your own personal goals are, whether that be to, you know, improve your mobility, whether that be to stay working as long as possible, set those goals and then figure out who needs to be on your team to help you reach them. Um, I think we're at an interesting place in healthcare where we kind of have come from one end of the spectrum where it was really the doctor tells you what to do every step of the way to this other end where we're really expecting a lot of, of people to make decisions on their own and to, to self-manage. That's kind of the new way, right? And I think it's really important to say as a, as a client or as a patient or a person with MS that you want to self-manage, but you need the support to do that. So you need the tools and you need the people to help to support you to be able to manage your MS. So if ever you feel like you're out there being expected to do that on your own, it's, it's fair to say, hey, I'd like to do this, but I need a bit of support and I need the tools and the education. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much, Denise and uh, Nancy. Any final thoughts you'd like to share with us? Okay. That MS is treatable and that MS is manageable. Um, that we are here as part of your healthcare team. Even if you live in a more rural area, there's ways of connecting via technology so that you, you're a multidisciplinary team. Um, and you're, we work with you. As Denise said, you have a role. We need, to, we need to help you define your role and give you control over as many things as we can in, in your life. And we work together. Um, we're here to help you live your best life. Excellent. I want to thank our panelists so much for being here today and contributing your time and your expertise. Uh, we have come to the end of our time for questions. Um, I need to mention again, we appreciate the support of Novartis and Roche to make this session possible. Now, as we wrap up, we've got a couple of slides to show you. We want to remind you about the MS Society of Canada's Knowledge Network, which is staffed by trained navigators who provide consistent and quality information and support. And you can connect by phone, email, or live chat, or through the MS website. And again, that's Natasha, who we've been hearing from today in today's session. I'd also like to take this opportunity to mention that we have a one-to-one -one peer support program. This is a telephone and internet-based program for individuals living with MS, their caregivers, and their loved ones. It connects trained peers to chat about life with MS and to provide mutual support. For more information, you can contact the Knowledge Network or go to the website, which is www.mssociety.ca. If you aren't already receiving the monthly MS e-news, you can sign up at mssociety.ca slash newsletter or contact the Knowledge Network. They know everything, those navigators. Uh, by receiving this publication directly to your email each month, it'll keep you connected to the MS community, but more importantly, keep you informed. You'll be kept updated on the Society's programs and services, plus fundraising events, research and treatment news inspiring personal stories, news on our advocacy and government relations initiatives, and so much more, including additional educational sessions as they come up. Again, I want to remind everybody that this session uh, has been recorded and it will be available on our YouTube channel in the near future. The slide that you see up right now gives you the MS Navigator phone number and the email address. And again, you can always find those through the MS Society website if you can't jot it down right now. There's the website, www.mssociety.ca. It's a fabulous resource, very comprehensive. There's lots of information there for you to explore and uh, ways to find other, uh, other services that you may need. So we encourage you to get involved with the MS Society. Uh, as you can imagine, the MS Society of Canada has had to shift how we've connected uh, during the pandemic to our MS community because of the pandemic. And connecting now is more important than ever, however, during the pandemic. So we encourage you to visit another website they've listed here for me, and that's www.wechallengems.ca to learn about how you can help. Now, the one person I neglected to give it a chance to give us some closing remarks to, shame on me, and so I'd like to leave things with Jesse now. Jesse, would you like to give us some final thoughts for today's session? 
For sure, for sure. Uh, no, and I, t I took no offense, so there's no problem there. Um, I think I would just reiterate what I already said, which is uh, what worked for me in the in the first year of diagnosis was really educating myself and trying to figure out exactly what I can control and what I can do for myself to improve my situation. So for me personally, that was uh, focusing on diet and exercise. I really benefited from getting organized and figuring out a routine uh, that was compatible with my fatigue and my jelly legs, as I put it at the beginning. Um, and then the other thing, and it's a big thing, I think, is finding your community. So really finding other people with MS and finding a support group, whether that's through the MS Society or, or really anywhere that it exists. The only thing I would mention is that the support group, I know I can speak to to mine specifically, we're not doctors, we're not there to give medical advice, we're there to give empathy and support, uh, just like the name says. So I, I really do think that people who are newly diagnosed and feel a little bit lost will benefit from that really uh, uh, to a, a, a huge amount because uh, just having that community is uh, really a great way to, to learn and, and realize that you're not the only person in the situation. Uh, there are many people like you that are, are going through the same thing. So. Uh, I would encourage everyone to join. It doesn't have to be my support group or the support group I facilitate, really just any support group or sort of uh, find that group uh, who will provide that support to you. Excellent. Thank you so much for your time, everybody. And again, I think the big takeaways that we've learned from the panel today is there is a network here to support you, be it the medical side, the emotional side, the physical side. Uh, MS is a complex disease and there's a lot of issues that need to be addressed, but you're not alone. There's a lot of people in, in this boat with you and there's a lot of people helping us row the boat all together. So reach out, um, figure out what is the best way for you to get the help you need and create that healthcare team that can support you moving forward on your journey with MS. Thank you so much for everybody who chose to be here today to start to help your journey, to gain more information and, and learn as much as you can. And thanks again to all our panelists for your really valuable insights and takeaways today. Take care, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Bye-bye.